Okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. And today we're going to be recreating another painting by another one of my favorite artists of all time. Today we are going to be looking at this very famous painting by Emmanuel Leutze. And it's called Washington Crossing the Delaware from 1851. And arguably one of the most famous paintings in American history. But oddly enough, in, in, in many ways, it has very little to do with the United States and more to do with what was happening in Europe at the time that it was painted. Now, we'll get into all the context of this painting as we go here. But uh, um, I'm really excited to do this because uh, Leutze is, is one of the, the great history painters of all time. And, and I love history painting. History painting is a genre of art that is focused on... Uh, documenting history <laughs> and uh, generally in the past was considered the highest achievement that a painter could could achieve painting paintings of historical moments was seen as sort of the pinnacle of a painter's career now this is the original painting uh, but I'm gonna focus today's episode really on this um, uh, the portrait of George Washington uh, General George Washington in the boat uh, just because this is a quite complex painting so we'll talk all about um, about about this uh, as we go here so let's just uh, let's zoom in and figure out what we're about to do today we're gonna get the image onto the canvas I haven't had a chance to do that so I'm gonna do this probably pretty quickly there's this it's fairly straightforward then we're going to stain the canvas with a little bit of color. That's what the Imprimatur is. While that's drying, we'll talk about the biography of Leutze. And then we'll do our underpainting. A few little lines here just so we don't lose the details as we paint it. And there isn't that much of a background, so that shouldn't take us too long. And we're going to spend the most of the class focusing on the foreground, George Washington's portrait itself. So... Ideally, we'll finish in about two hours, two and a half hours for today's painting. If you're painting the full one, well, we'll see you in a month because <laughs> you're going to be working on it for a while. Um, it, please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell. This Saturday, we're doing a special bonus episode where we're going to take a look at all of the incredible work that you've done and celebrate it as well as I offer a little bit of feedback for those who wish to receive it. And even if you're not contributing to the Facebook group, there's still lots of information that you can glean from looking at my critiques of other people's paintings. So consider sub subscribing and, and tuning in this Saturday. I think it's Saturday. <laughs> I'll have to take a look. Okay, so let's get the, the whole process of this painting begun here. So the as I said, this is the original painting. Now, there is an outline that I did for that painting, if you should wish to proceed in that direction. But as I said, I am going to focus on the, um, the portrait, zooming right in on that central figure uh, standing in the boat. And I've done an outline for that, which you can print out, right? So I've got outlines of both of them. They're all free. You can download them from the Dropbox folder. So let's just take a look at where that Dropbox folder is. Uh, it's there's a link to it in the first thing and I, I think it's third thing in the in the video description down below there You'll see that there is our at the, in that Dropbox folder lots of folders the ones at the top are our most basic paintings the intro to, to painting series and then these are very simple paintings that anyone should be able to achieve and then the next 150 folders are all paintings we've already done from artists from all over the world. You know, and speaking of American history, probably another one of the most famous American paintings of all time is James Whistler's portrait of his mother. Um, of course, we've done Jasper John's US flag. 
What would be another one comparable to this here? Have to think about it. Um, but anyway, we go all the way down to number 127 here. This is Emmanuel Loitz's uh, famous Washington Crossing, the Delaware. And if we click inside here, you're gonna see six files. You're gonna see the original painting, as well as two two versions, they outline a JPEG and a PDF, and then the, the detail of uh, George Washington himself, and then two versions of the outline of JPEG and a PDF, right? And then when you're done these paintings, whatever it is you're working on, upload it to the Facebook group, join the Facebook group, upload the, your picture, and then again, this Saturday, we'll take a look and celebrate all the artwork that's on there. And there's a lot of stuff. It's gonna be an action-packed episode. So, to get this onto the canvas, I've got here a, this is a nine by 12 sized canvas. And I'm not the biggest fan of this brand, so I'm not even gonna tell you what it is, uh, because you can see it's kind of warped a little bit. Canvas board ideally stays nice and flat and doesn't warp when it's painted. So not only have I taken this canvas board, and usually when you get it, it's it looks white, just like this. And it's, you've got plastic on it. What I also do is I put some more gesso on it. Gesso is is basically like white acrylic paint, but instead of white, it's more of like a plastery powder that fills in the weave of the canvas so we have less texture. I also sand it down because when I'm making a painting, I prefer having as little texture on here as possible. Um, I've described it before as like the difference between buttering toast and buttering a um, waffle, right? If you've ever tried to butter a waffle, you know that half the butter comes off the knife before you've even gotten a quarter of the way across the waffle because all of those, the, the waffle has all those little pockets that suck up all of the butter, which if you love butter is a great thing, <laughs> but it can be kind of frustrating because you got to use a lot of butter. It's this versus when you're just buttering a piece of toast, the butter just goes right across the toast. And so it's the same thing when we're painting onto a canvas, which is has a lot of texture. It takes, it's harder to go right across the surface um, without that paint coming off the paintbrush almost too quickly. Okay, so I'm just going to do very basic outlining here. You see, I kind of uh, went a little bit nuts with <laughs> the hair. And I'm not really sure what uh, what's happening in this part of the hair. It all sort of looks like uh, some cartoon abdominal muscles, like his hair's um, on steroids or something. But uh, it, it basically, it's all takes. This is all in shadow, so we'll kind of fake it out when we paint in that area. So I'm not even going to bother doing any of the outlines in there. The same thing inside this hair. I just sort of do all this, those, those lines in there just because I like to draw and it's kind of fun just to kind of go a little bit wacky and, and I kind of want these drawings to exist beyond just simply a quick tracing and so just for, for people's all right, that's basically what I'm going to do for the hair. I'm not going to do much more than that, right? There's no, I don't think there's any need. Um, again, we're just remember the purpose of these outlines is not to capture as much detail on the canvas. It's just to help us know where all of the, the, the main compositional elements are like where the eye is where and where the nose is etc and then beyond that we fill that information in uh, with our paintbrush when we're painting it and, you know same thing with this kind of crest that's on Washington's hat here you know a lot of this is going to be in darkness or in shadow so um, we don't really need to spend too much time trying to articulate it because in the in the original painting the sun is kind of coming from the opposite side from behind him 
right? So uh, he would be kind of bathed in, in shadow. We're also going to talk today about the, the, the what this painting actually depicts, um, like the not only the, the story of Loitze himself, but um, the story of George Washington crossing the Delaware and the reason why it historically is so significant. Okay, so this pen is, there's no ink <laughs> coming out of the pen, but it's still transferring, right? Because this works on pressure, right? So it doesn't really, you could do this with your fingernail and still transfer an image on here. I just have to try to remember what I've done and what I haven't done. I think that might be enough. Just want to make sure there's nothing glaring missing here. Just want to get his jawline. There's always something afterwards to go like, ah, how did I miss that? Looks good. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. So, we'll pr I like to keep this nearby to refer to, and then I'm just going to quickly clean this up. I'd be super interested to hear in the comments if you're actually attempting to make that version. Um, we will talk here in just a couple seconds. This painting is, is very famous and has been... Um, redone in many different ways by many different artists it's it's a very iconic painting in that way and um, so we'll take a look here shortly at some of the other versions of this painting but that looks great I'm happy we got that uh, settled here so let's move on to the next step so once we've got our image onto the canvas let's stain the canvas with a little bit of color so what i'm going to do is get my paints out and i'm so proud of myself you'll know that i've been talking about wanting to one day clean out all these tubes of paint my my nozzles which were i finally did it right before as i was waiting for the computer to reboot here had a little bit of a tech glitch um i got a little bit of busy work done that I've been wanting to do for a while. Okay, so what I just did is I squeezed out some warm yellow onto this palette. I'm gonna stir it up and I'm gonna cover this in a second. But I know some of you are like watching for the first time, like what, what are we doing here? Well, this is like, what color is this? Well, the tube of paint I just squeezed out was this Azo Yellow Deep. It's a warm yellow. And you don't, I'm not sponsored by them. You don't have to buy this kind of paint but these are the tubes of paint if you want to do exactly what I'm doing this is my recommendation Amsterdam's like an inexpensive student grade paint you get a lot for not very much relative to for instance golden you're, you're gonna spend three times the price for three times less material which sounds crazy but you are getting a, a higher grade of pigment and more pigment in each um, tube of paint but for like a beginner painter, I guarantee you, you will not notice any difference whatsoever. A more experienced painter, for sure, yeah. But if you're just beginning, you know, it's like, I remember when uh, I had, I used to have a Google Android phone and I, uh, it, I dropped it in a lake in Algonquin Park, it stopped working. So I went and uh, I was like, maybe I should get a trans, finally jump aboard this whole iPhone thing. And I got the cheapest, most basic one, and it was fantastic. I didn't know, right? And then I, my wife had a much more, and I'm like, wow, that is much better. But for all intents and purposes, my cheap little iPhone 5C worked just fine. Anyway, here's a few more uh, brands of paint that you can use. Artist Loft, that's from Michael's Art Supply. Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, 
and Dyler Rowney. Okay, so let's, um, and again, we've talked about all those different paints and you can go back and screenshot them if you like. There's also information in the Dropbox folder. Okay, give this a nice good stir. Now, Leutze probably, he would not have used a warm yellow like this for his imprimatura, and I'm sure he would have done an imprimatura because he's he's very much from the classical painting tradition, um, sort of what we might call the academic method, um, because he would have he was kind of classically trained, so he would have used some kind of stain onto the surface, but it was probably a uh, kind of a rusty red brown color that he would have put on here, which is sort of like your mid value and often used especially by both landscape painters and portrait painters. So one might ask, well, then why are we doing this yellow? It's just because being a bit more of a beginner oriented um, series of videos here, we can use this warm yellow to roughly mimic that brown. It goes on much faster because we don't have to mix any colors. And I kind of, as I, as I started doing this out of pure convenience, I was like, you know, I kind of think I prefer it. So this has sort of just become my own little thing. And you don't have to do this at all. You could mix a brown um, using mostly warm yellow, a little bit of warm red, and a little very small amount of warm blue. And you'd be off and running. You notice that I this is I also put water in here, and this is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylics because um, usually people put a lot of water in, and they basically turn their acrylics into watercolor paints, which is fine if that's what you want to do, but you might as well just go and actually just use watercolors. Uh, Paula says, hi Heidi, I just missed the statement, so the boat is not included. No, we're just doing this portrait here today. If you want to do the boat, Paula, go right ahead and paint the entire painting itself. I know you're always looking for things to paint, so that one would keep you busy if you want to do that one. <laughs> okay. So, I'm just, I put a maybe a lot of water in here so I'm just gonna quickly blow dry this so uh, it dries a little bit faster Okay, so let's take a look at who Emmanuel, Emmanuel Loitze was. <laughs> so um, let's just quickly browse through the Wikipedia entry here. So Loitze was born on May 24th, so just a couple of, of days ago, over uh, nearly 200 years ago, two, well, just over 200 years ago and uh, died in 1868, so at the young age of 52 years old. So when we look at um, some of his work, it's surprising that here on WikiArt there's only 11 paintings by him in here, um, considering the significance that he has, but it's not also, it's not that surprising considering how relatively young he was when he passed away. 
So we'll talk about some of that work here in a moment. Um, interestingly enough, uh, so Leutze is born in Germany, and at, I think, age 10, his family moved to the United States, to Philadelphia, or eventually end up in Philadelphia. And uh, it's during this time that uh, he, he starts to express himself creatively. And his father gets ill, and while his father is essentially dying on his sickbed, Leutze starts making portraits, often of the people that are coming to visit his father and, and pay respects, because they know that he's he's not going to be around much longer. And he's, he's selling these portraits for $5 a piece, which back in the early 1800s is a significant amount of money. So I imagine there's probably something of like, people buying these portraits of the son of this fellow that they they might know as a bit of like um you know there's there's a little i'm just thinking we're pretty like oh man i guess, I guess we should probably buy a, a painting by this by the kid you know it's i feel bad for turning him down so like so there's a little bit of the businessman in the back of of uh of there which plays I think a role later on especially with regards to today's painting um, he's sort of I you know in, in in a shrewd way taking advantage of this unfortunate uh, um, situation that his family finds himself in anyway he uh, he starts taking some classes in Philadelphia with John Reuben Smith and from there, you know, it's especially and 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 Reuben Smith is like a portrait painter, right? So he's really learning some of these more classical painting techniques that we'll talk about today, uh, specifically like glazing techniques, etc. Um, but it's eventually, you know, after his father dies, you know, the family is in a little is kind of struggling a little bit. So he moves back to Germany with his family and while he's there he he take he st starts studying at the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf uh, and uh, he also uh, he, he starts taking classes with some of the, the great painters of his time like Carl Friedrich Lessing who is uh, a very famous German painter at the time and um, you know very quickly is is creating some pretty important paintings. This Columbus before the Council of Salamanca is, um, you know, where, where Columbus is trying to drum up support for uh, one of his ventures across the ocean. So he, he's, start, he's making a name for himself in Europe, in Germany, in his home country. And he also, uh, because he spent you know, the kind of these formative 10 years or so in, uh, I think it was 15 years he spent. So he would have moved back to Germany when he was like, what, 25, I guess. Uh, he, he is sort of like, because it, 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 traveling across the ocean isn't like it is today. You get on a, you know, you, there's hundreds and th or thousands of people flying back and forth every single day, maybe every hour now. Back then, that was a, a pretty big journey, and so meeting someone who was German, who sort of essentially grew up in their formative teenage years in the United States and then came back, he would be, you know, a, a person that anyone who was at vaguely interested in going to uh, North America would want to talk to, right? If you're thinking of maybe moving to the United States or Canada, well, you're going to have to go see Leutze, right? Because he's spent a lot of time there like he might give you some good advice as to what to do where to go who to talk to etc right so he becomes a sort of central um uh figure within not just the art community but you know the 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 local community and it, this also becomes more and more of a um Th that fact, I think, plays increasing um, uh, importance because during the 1840s, throughout most of Europe, there is this revolutionary sentiment that's, that is building, and eventually there are, in 1848, revolutions throughout France and Germany, Italy, all over the place, and... Um, 
mostly against the various different monarchies that existed in Europe at the time. And Leutze was a was a big supporter of, of those movements. He, he was sort of like a young revolutionary himself. And um, so there's a lot of people who are kind of looking around thinking like, oh, man, we looking at the United States, which uh, w about what 75 years prior had had their own revolution, which was successful. Right. So this, you know, this myth of the United States as being the the the, the bastion of freedom, you know, is formulated after the American Revolution, the 1776 to 78, where a lot of people around, not just the United States, but around the world's kind of turn and look, oh, look at those people. A bunch of the sort of ragtag army took on the British military, one of the most, if not the most, for, the foremost military in the world, and defeated it, and now have their own country. Without a king, they're electing their own representatives. That sounds pretty interesting, right? And obviously this had also happened in France, but then there was sort of a, um, after the revolution, there was, you know, Napoleon rises to power and basically the French Empire kind of starts happening. I mean, that's a whole other, we've talked about that with Jacques-Louis David, etc. So there is already these revolutionary feelings, but they kind of bubble up in the mid 1800s. And um, so anyway, Leutze thinking about what's going on in Europe at the time and this the 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 hunger for revolution and he's an artist a painter what does he think best represents revolution what what can he paint uh, that would speak to other Germans other Europeans about why they should bother getting you know fighting for freedom fighting against the monarchy well, what about the American Revolution, right? And and obviously, and that would have been very familiar to anyone who was interested in revolutionary art or revolutionary movements in Europe. Um, and he really kind of focuses in on this moment of Washington crossing the Delaware. And maybe it's just worth. I think I have a Google map. Did I map that? Okay, so we'll just do a quick sidebar into what this, why this moment is significant. So, um, essentially, let me see. I'm, I don't want to cover the entire uh, history of the American Revolution, but um, if we zoom out, basically, the. Um, Let me see. I don't want to go. Let me. I'm trying to think of how to just. I'm, leading up to Washington crossing the Delaware is the United States has declared independence from Great Britain, and the the British are not happy about this, and they they are d determined to crush this American Revolution. So they send all their big ships their military back across the ocean to what was then their colonies. They believed they owned all of these, uh, not only the land, but the people on it, that they were all subjects of the king. And they basically rout the, the American military. They're, uh, you know, they were centered in like the three biggest American cities are Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. There, there is huge battles in and around New York City and in New York State, and Washington and his his military are forced to retreat into New Jersey, and uh, basically uh, George Washington loses about ninety percent of the military forces. So they are on the ropes. There's they're within, you know. Um, basically a few months of the whole American Revolution being crushed by the by the British and the they are on the run 
they they are retreating during the the fall of 1776 so they declare independence in, on July 4th and by December the the American military is retreating and they they retreat all the way through New Jersey all the way to the Delaware River and they cross over the Delaware in the beginning of December I think December 5th or something around there and um, the the British military which is which is hot on their heels picking off any stragglers uh, because there's also American soldiers who are who who are just like you know what I'm I'm done we're we're clearly gonna lose this war I'm bailing I'm going home I don't have no more part of this everybody I enlisted with is dead there's no hope this is ridiculous so there's a basically about I think five five thousand American troops that make it across the this the Delaware River which is you know probably I would say what about the width of maybe two football fields across this river and uh so they basically they get here and they hunker down and the british come and and they they chase them acro across the river and then they stop and uh because most european uh, militaries at this time fight in that in what seems absurd to us now but in in these very rigid formations right and they're they like to fight in big open fields with you know like 50 guys shoulder to shoulder marching and then they they shoot and then they they bend down and they fill their muskets and the people behind them shoot and it, it seems crazy now because you're if you're on the opposite side you're just shooting at a wall of people coming to you and they sort of depend on this very, um, they depend on numbers. Yeah, we're going to lose 25, 30% of our, of our soldiers as we advance, but we're eventually just going to overwhelm you because guns at that time take about a minute to reload or less if you're, if you're much faster, right? So they're, that's the way that the British fight. And they don't like fighting in the middle of winter most most european uh, militaries at this time you know when the winter comes they just hunker down wait it out so that's what they do so, so much so that cornwallis the uh, the head of of the the british military chasing after washington he decides you know what let's just uh, set up some tents build some trenches and he starts heading back to london england he's like we'll pick this up back in in like march and then we'll everyone will be nice and rested and we'll go and we'll finish off that american army and this whole revolution thing will be a, a distant memory washington knows this he knows that if he waits all winter long by the time you know march rolls around they are going to get crushed and not only there's even uh, some people who speculate that they were going to wait for this river to freeze over and then maybe in january the british were just going to come right across and finish it even earlier so washington decides we have one last shot this we're going to push all our marbles into this one last hurrah and see if we can do something because not only that there's they've they've signed up all of these conscripts for and and they're they're basically their their contracts end in January. So if you know in another but a lot of the American soldiers are like well we just got to wait another month here and then we can go home and we get our salary everything's fine right. Washington's like if we don't do this now most of our soldiers are going to take off and then by the time the you know uh, the British decide to invade there's just going to be 20 or 30 of us left right so they decide on Christmas Eve of uh 1778 is that when it is 17 sorry 1776 on Christmas Eve they cross the Delaware just like what you see here in the famous painting and do a surprise uh, invasion of the Hessian troops and the Hessians are essentially like the the German forces which are allied with the British that are stationed in Trenton so they cross here there's now a historic monument and park here 
and then they they kind of ride down here and surprise all of the German troops which are celebrating Christmas they're all ha getting drunk and partying they are they're not expecting the Americans to invade and they're certainly not expecting them on Christmas morning because this despite this painting um, looking like it's happening at maybe sunrise it actually happens in, right in the middle of the night so Lloyd's has taken some creative liberty to um, turn this painting into kind of a morning scene even though it happens in the middle of the night and this the the capture of Trenton and all of the food and cannons and guns is is literally the turning point in the American Revolution and you know we're not going to continue the story from there on but obviously the Americans ended up winning that war and the rest is history as they say right so this is you know a like a, a um, highly symbolic moment not just in American history but for people outside of the United States who are looking at what happened 75 years ago in 1850 when he makes his painting and they're there's like that's the moment when everyone thought it was all lost that the king was going to crush the Americans and the Americans turned the tide and won so Leutze says like if there was one moment that I want to describe in a painting it's going to be that one when Washington crosses the Delaware his last hope that is going to resonate with revolutionary movements across Europe so he makes this painting he ends up making three versions of it ironically the the version the, the first one that he did was destroyed in World War II in the Allied bombing of Germany um, so it's it's ironic that the that the the painting which depicts this great moment in American history is destroyed by well we not we don't know if it was by Americans or Canadians or British uh, who were bombing Germany during World War II but it is it's destroyed by the allies now Leutze knew very quickly that this painting was was a kind of a hit it, it it took off in Germany where it was housed obviously and the next year he makes a second version of that painting which is now on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and it, you can see this incredible gilded gold frame that it's exhibited and you can also see how big this painting is so George Washington the central well he's just he's essentially the central figure of this painting is um, uh, that he's life-size if you're standing in front of this painting which I've done several times I went to art school in New York um, you 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 can stand in front of it and your head would probably come up to the you know maybe his knee here and you'd be you're, you're looking up at him and that's again a design choice by Leutze to um, to kind of create this heroic quality to this painting um, I also you know this this frame is worth just mentioning just really quickly before we move on was designed by Leutze himself as well um, this painting was originally displayed in I think it was the New York exhibition in 19 or 1864 um, in, with this beautiful frame so and and it immediately takes off and there's an exchange of there's an American who buys it for I think like ten thousand dollars American at the time which is an outrageous sum of money basically almost a half a million dollars in today's money which is expensive for a painting but back then it was almost unheard of um what do I want to say um I don't really know the story of why he died of a heat stroke at age 52 but um, he was still working on paintings while he was uh, you know he, he wasn't an old man as I said when he died but it just gives you a quick idea well, before we move on here just some of the other great history paintings that Leutze did here here's another Columbus painting um, I mean th these paintings have sort of ah the advance uh, westward here come on like like these wagons going over top of the mountains 
These are all great. This is also, I should mention, this is the companion piece to Washington crossing the Delaware, Washington rallying the troops at Monmouth. Um, so this is also uh, a very famous Leutze painting. Not nearly as famous as the one as well here. Uh, so he's really documenting these very important moments in American history, and he is a German by birth, but again, he spent most of his his formative years in the United States, so it clearly feels like a, uh, um, a an affinity for the, uh, the United States. That is awesome. Look at that. Cortez storming Teocali. Wow. That is cool. That's a story for another day, um, that Cortez. Um... Oh, and, you know, it's worth just knowing, like, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know, one of the, the great authors of the time, is, is becomes a friend of Leutze. Leutze becomes, like, a, you know, a very famous figure uh, towards the end of his life. And, and he's, um, he's sort of celebrated throughout the United States. So, um, is there anything else I wanted to share here? No, let's let's get right into the painting, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, the next step we're going to do here is a little bit of underpainting, where I want to just do a few details uh, on the face, and maybe maybe that will be all we need to do to, just to get started. So, let's mix some paint here. So to get started, I'm going to put my cool blue. So I'm going to mix my my blues together there. I'm, I'm going to put probably all of my paints on here, but not a lot of each one, just because I'm never really sure which how much of each color I need. I always tell people, put about as much paint on your palette as toothpaste on your toothbrush, because um, you don't want to waste paint. I, uh, I, was, I started teaching a painting class here in Vancouver recently, and at the end of every class I'm cleaning up, and people are, th they threw out so much paint that I have enough paint here to make another six paintings. So, Lots of people in the chat there. Paula, Deborah, Heidi, Donna. <laughs> okay, so what I've, I've done here is I've got my cool blue, my warm red, and my cool yellow together. And I mix this together, and I'm going to get a black. And you can see I, there's no... I didn't really do too much to measure these out. I'm kind of just eyeballing it. I kind of mix these together and then I can see the color as it develops and then I can decide what I want to do. So right, if I get these ratios bang on, then I'm going to have a basically a black paint here. Now I'm a little bit off because it's a little bit, it's a little bit purple and a little bit brown. And so that tells me that I probably have um, I need to put add more cold blue into this mixture to get a black if I want it. Now, I actually don't, doesn't really matter necessarily what color I, I have for what we're about to do here for my underpainting. Um, because it's going to be underneath everything. And in fact, a little bit of a brownish color like that is going to suit me just fine. Um, so, but if you want to, to make it a black, just add a little more blue. And if it's a little bit green, that tells us we need a little bit more red in the color. Okay. 
So I'm going to take a small brush. And I'm just going to go right in here. Actually, let's split these. Just a bit. Still a little bit tacky, but um, yeah, we'll do the the nose here. What's interesting about the way that, that Leutze did this painting is that this uh, Washington in, 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 in this artwork is the only person who's kind of seen directly in profile. And profile is one of, is kind of historically a way that artists would describe like a very important person we know on like the backs of quarters and dollar bills we we usually have kings and queens or now presidents and prime ministers um, but uh, so there's kind of a deliberate positioning of of Leutze uh, or by Leutze of Washington in this very iconic um, angle Whereas almost, whereas everyone, literally everyone else, in the rest of the painting, we see from the front or three quarter view, etc. Okay, now I'm just trying to think. Do I want to do anything more? I think that's probably good. I think that's probably all I need to do to get that painting started. So I might just quickly blow dry that because I'm going to next paint right next to it. So I just want to make sure this is nice. And I just got to make sure I have a sip of tea here if I go any further. Okay, so the next step. So now that we've got our uh, underdrawing or the image transferred onto the canvas, we've got our imprimatura, this yellow stain, and a little bit of underpainting. Now let's start uh, adding some color into the background. So, um, let's back that out a bit. Now, as I said, we're just doing the, the this very small portion of the original painting. So we could, if we just take a look at the original, right? So we are basically doing that kind of image, right? <laughs> That's, that's what we're painting, and that's sort of what it looks like up close. So here we have, we could just paint a white background. It might be nice to add a little bit of nuance here to try to capture a little bit of this um, kind of cold and foreboding sky. Now you could paint the background purple or pink or green or bright blue, it could be up to you. I'm probably going to stay with something white, but I might give it a little bit of a hint of color in here. So, uh, obviously we're going to need some white, so I'm going to put that in, on my palette. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of my cool blue to this mixture. Yeah, let's use this white brush. 
So I'm going to add a little bit, like you can see, that's how much paint I'm putting on there. Very small amount. And then I'm going to mix, I'm going to take some of my matte medium. Matte medium is paint without pigment, right? This material is in all of these paints. The only difference is this let's say the red has this plus red pigment right or this is just like my blue but the only difference is it also has blue in it this has none of that it's, it'll dry totally clear so it's just like we're adding the more medium into the paint so, so let's use our bigger brush actually let's, yeah let's use our bigger brush from here stir this up so adding all this medium is going to make this paint a little bit more transparent which i love because um i want to preserve some of the yellow background i don't want it to disappear entirely because i really like that warm because if i just paint that white right over top it'll be as if that we never painted yellow there and it's sort of like what's the point of going to all that trouble oops I just got a bit of yellow on my brush here so that might change the color into a little bit of a slightly greenish not that big of a deal for me personally but okay I'm just gonna spread that around so I like tr putting this on and then judging afterwards it, how light or dark it actually is. One thing with matte medium is depending on how thickly you apply this, you got to be kind of quick. You don't want to diddle daddle too much because it's going to start to dry and then it can be kind of a bit of a pain to work with. So we want that's why I'm using a nice big brush even though I can't get all the little details. Okay, so it's not quite the color that I want, not quite yet, especially, you know, if I compare them side by side, you're like, wow, that's totally not the right color, but I'm going to blow dry this and I'm going to do another coat on top of it, which I think will, will really help. So I'm just going to... Yeah, I just saw in the chat there, Evans says, I was not there before uh, my question all about the sketch. Did you use a projector to draw? Um, and I see Pascal already did a nice detailed answer. So yes, in the description below, you'll see a, a link to a Dropbox folder in that Dropbox folder. Go to folder 127 and you'll see the outline for this, which you can then print off and then transfer using carbon paper. Uh, and I did that whole thing at the beginning of the episode, so you could even just pause right now and just jump right back about 10 minutes and you can see that whole process. Okay, so this is not quite opaque enough. There's still too much yellow coming through and it is a little bit patchy. So I'm gonna just add more, I'm just gonna basically do another layer of this might even put a little bit more medium 
in here. And I'm going to take a bit more blue. Ooh, that was a little more than I was expecting. So I'm also just going to put a little bit more white back in here. much white but which kind of so let's just dilute that again okay. there we go oh I love it I love it beautiful the only things that I, I just don't want too much, especially too much white on the face. So I'm just kind of quick about once I get it, if I get anything onto areas I don't want, just wipe it off with my finger. And hey, you know, I, I, I could be convinced to do another layer after this, potentially, we'll see. But just looking at it, I'm like, mm, maybe it needs another one. Yeah, you know what? I'm just going to blow dry this and I'm going to do another layer. It's just easier than fiddling with it. I can do a much better job if I just act, use a little bit of patience. Okay, so I just want to get this area right next to the face. Ah! I somehow got some other paint on there somehow. Oops, let's just clean that off. And I was a little bit... I rushed that blow dry session and I've now kind of... it's Some of that paint is kind of... Um, gotten smudged a bit under here. You know, you probably can't, you won't be able to see it really on camera, but that's, that's the thing when you're doing this thing live and you're trying to keep the train running. Sometimes I just go a little bit more, if you can believe it, I'm even more impatient on camera than I am normally. I'm pretty impatient most of the time with when it comes to my own artwork. So just slowing down and blow drying for that little bit longer is very helpful. Okay. 
So I'm going to blow dry this, and then I think I might do a little bit of a fade with a bit of blue, maybe, from the bottom? I don't know. Let's just think about it for a second. Okay, now dare I? No, as, as when we saw these side by side, you can see they're pretty close. So, um, I do I want to do? Let's see, it's still a little bit wet. Is here wet? You know what? Maybe let's. Uh, if I do this, I really should do this now. Just here, I just noticed I did not do underneath that chin. I just want to paint over. So I'm painting over these dark lines on the face here, because you can see there's not really a dark, actual dark lines on the outside edge of the face there. So I'm just kind of concealing them just a little bit. Um, you know what? I think I'm just gonna move forward. I was thinking about maybe doing a little gradient up here. Um, We'll, we'll see, maybe, uh, really, if I wanted to do that, I should do that right now. I'm just thinking about time-wise, wanting to kind of get uh, this painting. <laughs> Pascal says, if we stop after his clothes, um, we can pretend he's a Simpsons character because of the yellow. Uh -huh. Funny guy, Pascal. <laughs> okay. So, uh, there is some paint drying up here. So, I think I'm going to just go down to the bottom and work on this area. And then by that time, the face will be nice and dry. Just because I don't want to wipe or get any, mix any of this white paint into the face here. So... Let's um, move to a next step. So, now that we've got our background established, potentially done, we'll see how things go. Uh, let's move on to, we're going to do maybe the, well, eventually we're going to do the whole thing, but I think we'll just go right to the clothes first here. Um... So, next up, what should we do first? We could do, 
this gray and the brown. In fact, this brown that we made earlier um, was intended to be kind of our darkest color. Remember I said it's not quite black. It's still a little bit brownish. We could use that color. We're going to make a, a gray with it by adding more Let's just use this color. We could use, we could make a, a little bit warmer of a, should we make a bit warmer of a brown? Let's make an actual warm brown. I, I was like, it's not the point. The point for you guys is probably more to learn than just do it, right? So let's, let's make a warm brown. Let's take our warm yellow. And let's take a bit of warm red. So we make a warm orange or a saturated orange. And let's take a little bit of warm blue. The more blue we put into this mixture, the darker brown that we're gonna have, right? And to make a skin tone, we just do this basic thing and just add some white to it. But I'm going to take this color and then I'm going to add some darker color to it for this area off to the side. Let's take a bit more. Okay. So let's paint this. Notice I'm trying to paint it in the same direction. So that's not quite as dark, but it's we've got that color established there. Let's do kind of above here as well. This one we can even glaze a little bit of gray onto later because it looks a little bit more grayish. Let's, I'm going to do this down here too. Well, I've got the same color. We're going to do this. Will be a, a blue, but we'll put brown underneath it, and then we can put a, a kind of a blue over top. So I think those are, that's good. Um, you know what? Let's take a bit more of this color. Put this in the hair as well. Again, all of this is gonna get darker. potentially do this in the hat as well because there is a little bit of brown up here 
So you know what I'm, I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my blue and let's just take this color. We'll add a lot more blue to it. So it's, we got a very dark bluey brown. If this goes too green, then that means you just have a lot of yellow in there and just add a little bit more red and blue and I think you'll get the color you want. Now I'm going to, by doing this, I'm going to obliterate all of this stuff up here. So just pointing that out, I'm, I'm not too worried about it because it's all just going to be in shadow anyway. Um, So this is not quite as blue as I ultimately want it to get. We've got this very, very dark brown. But eventually we're gonna add some darker, just basically blue glazes, warm blue glaze over top of all of this. So now I've got all that on there. Let's just try to emphasize some of that movement. Okay. What else? Let's do some of this kind of golden color. Okay, so I see, I, I forgot to mention, so Pascal's talking in the chat about the Simpsons character. I think it's worth just sort of taking a quick look um, at some of these other versions of the painting that have been painted by other people. Um, here's a Japanese version. Just kind of cue these up. Um... I should have had all these ready to go, shouldn't I? Kent Monkman, who's a famous Canadian artist. Oh, maybe here's... No. No, I don't want to register for anything. Um... Anytime. I guess it's the same. Ah! So Jacob Lawrence, remember, I think uh, maybe it was a year ago, we did a, a Jacob Lawrence baseball painting, a, a, a player hitting a baseball, and there was the catcher and umpire behind them in the stands. This is another painting by Jacob Lawrence, an African-American artist in 1954. This is his version of uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware. You can see clearly very different, much more Cubist-inspired, 
But obviously, as an African American, he has a very different point of view on American history than Loitza would have had, especially a hundred years prior to having made that painting. Here's Robert Colescott, also another African American artist, George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware. Right, George Washington Carver, very different historical character than George Washington himself. Uh, here's Peter Saul, who's an Ameri another American artist, um, famous for his almost like graffiti-inspired artworks. They seem to be taking forever to load. So let's just close that. Um, Kara Walker, another African American artist. That's her version. There's also a very famous, uh, I just want to find this painting because I don't see it appearing here. Larry Rivers. I would have thought this would have, This is the most famous version of it. Um, it's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Oh, he did, several, he must have done several of these. But this is his version of Washington Crossing, the, which was like, what? Doesn't even really look like it. Right, uh, Larry Rivers is or, or was a uh, kind of uh, abstract expressionist painter who kind of became more of a pop artist a little bit later on. So he's at that kind of crux of abstraction and figuration, uh, similar with artists like Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, who we who we did the American flag for um, American Independence Day a few years ago, right? So artists that were still using some of the, the the very brushy expressionist abstract but bringing the figure back into the work in fact it's worth just quickly mentioning that when pop art began before it was called pop art it was called the new figurative movement it was seen as a return to the human form to imagery as opposed to abstract painting which was all about getting rid of pick of representation anyway uh, let's get back to the matter at hand here, but it is it is funny that you know you're talking about the Simpsons in here. There's many different versions of Robert or of Washington crossing the Delaware by many different artists. Um, okay, so which oh yeah there are we want this kind of golden color here, which is similar to what we were mixing here with this brown. We just want to have a lot more yellow in it. So I'm just going to put it to the side and mix into it. So it's going to be slightly different than what we have down here. So let's put this Now that's not the exact right color yet. We're gonna build to it, but it's we're getting we're sort of getting into the ballpark. Because like pretty much everything in this painting, it's a matter of kind of subtle glazing layers to get to where we eventually want to go. I should also mention like Larry Rivers, who we, I just showed an image. He he was um, very closely identified with the the Beat Generation. In fact, he might be considered sort of one of the the you know the the Beat writers. You know Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, um, William S. Burroughs. My first s exhibition after art school was with William S. Burroughs, a two person exhibition, which still blows my mind. That, that ever happened um but larry rivers was the the um probably the, the artist most closely visual artist most closely identified with the the beat poets 
Uh, okay. Yeah, Pascal, interesting versions of the painting. Pretty cool. So lots of different ways that we could reinterpret this painting. Let's do our... Let's do the red first. We got a warm red. And I'm going to put just the warm red right out of the tube. It's going to be, well... Is this going to be too intense? Let's... We can always, you know, um, take this color down later. I mean, obviously, what we're doing here is we're taking the really the most significant person in this painting and we're isolating it. So this certainly would not have been how Loitza would have preferred. Uh, he wanted us to see the whole, you know, Washington in context with all the other people on the boat. Um, so, you know, the colors we use if we're creating a painting like this we might have to kind of diverge from the original a little bit just to make our own painting work, right? So that's why I was thinking maybe doing a little bit of a blue gradient in here just to add a little bit more color back into the painting because there is a lot of blue in the original. It happens to be in other places, clearly, right? Kind of being a little sloppy here. Um, we can well, every, again. This is just the beginning. We're gonna clean it up as we go, but. Donna says, he looks very aboriginal to me. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He reminds me of an old boyfriend of mine. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you know, the, the, the George Washington, you know, a very kind of iconic face. Very, it's not, it's... You know, almost sort of, you wonder, like, is it, was his face, did that inspire people, or because he became important, we now associate him with kind of a heroic, but he does have this very, like, you know, this looks like a lot of Greek sculpture, and I'm sure Loitza, growing up in the, in the academic tradition, was, you know, had painted and sculpted and looked at lots of images of Greek art but really just that that particularly strong jaw the pronounced nose um, are are typical of like greco-roman artwork um, and even the pose especially if we look at the original um, you know, Washington kind of standing here near the prow of the boat with one foot up. You know, it kind of looks like that, um, what's that rum, Captain Morgan's rum with the one leg up there, right? Very iconic, strong um, uh, pose here, which, you know, many people have pointed out. When the, So this is happening on you know, a very cold Christmas Eve 1776 they're crossing through water that is moving quite quickly with big chunks of frozen ice no one would have been standing on that boat that would have been 
not only foolhardy for himself, but could easily have capsized a boat which could have somewhere between 10 to 15 people, including, as we see in the background, horses and cannons. So there's no way Washington would have stood up in a boat like this in the middle of the night. Again, remember this painting sort of doesn't quite depict reality. He's, he's made it sort of sunrise instead of middle of the night when it actually took place. Um, but really trying to emphasize the, the heroic quality of this moment. Um, and I'm sure every, the, most of the time, they were probably just bundled, chattering teeth, not standing proud. I think it's also just worth mentioning here uh, about this painting is Leutze has made a, a very deliberate attempt to include as many different people in this composition as, as possible. Um, not only, obviously, we have Washington here. Um, I just forgot who this figure... This person here becomes the fifth president of the United States. You could Google that and try to remember, <laughs> uh, figure out who that is. We So we see Washington as well as his protege here. We have um, a couple of people kind of wearing these kind of fur caps you know, that kind of look like Davy Crockett, probably like fur trader kind of like people. We have a Scotsman here, with very distinctive kind of hat. Um, we have an African-American man rowing next to them. Uh, probably another soldier here. What many people believe to be a woman here. We have a couple of farmers in the background here. And then what is believed to be a Native American also rowing here with a very distinctive kind of pouch so what Leitz is, is trying to do is show that like a revolution is is not just a bunch of soldiers but the people coming together overcoming their differences to rise up against a tyrannical government and um which he is trying to encourage his fellow germans to do against the aristocracy in germany right so there's a lot going on here. A lot of, you know, when you just look at us, oh, this is Washington crossing the Delaware. But you have to remember the audience that, that Leutze was originally making this painting for. This is made for German people or Europeans to inspire them to follow in the footsteps of the Americans. And, you know, this painting is exhibited, it was finished 50 years after Washington dies. So there's plenty of people who were alive um, during while Washington was alive, even during the American Revolution, so there's there's a bunch of festivities in the United States acknowledging that moment. It's, so there's, I mean, we could talk for hours and hours just about the painting, let alone making our own version of it. Um, uh, James Monroe, thank you, Pascal. Yes, the fifth American president. That's the fellow holding that flag tightly. So. Um, let's paint this gray here. So we can just take our existing color here, put it in the middle, and then we'll add some white to it. So this was our darkest color. Now you look at that and go like, well, that's kind of purple, Michael. Well, I don't want it to be purple. I want it to be a little more gray. So remember I said before this color um, was kind of a little bit brownish. It looks like actually maybe we need a little bit more cool yellow in there. And we put that cool yellow in and it kind of kills that purple and just becomes a gray. So let's just take more white. I think I'm actually going to have to up to a bigger brush here in a moment. ratios even more it's gonna take some of that other paint here and just mix it in might as well and then let's paint with it
And as always, I like to get in kind of the edges here. to take the same color and put it in his hair right now. And you know what? I'm just going to put this color right here. I don't We'll, we'll add something to this later on, but just kind of get it started. I'm not even really sure. It does kind of look like maybe a bit of a eagle wings. I thought this was a ribbon. It probably is a ribbon, but maybe there's some sort of metallic component to it as well. Um... I'm going to use this, I'm just going to take some, a little bit more white. Paint that there. And then I'm just going to take a little bit of yellow, mix it in with this white. Let's take some of this gray even. Okay, Again, we'll get all these highlights, that gray, I am tempted to even glaze with this gray right now, so maybe let's do that, because while we've got that color mixed, we should maybe use it, so let's just put Actually, I'm going to just, before I do that, let's just blow dry all this. We've got lots of paint on here. Okay, let's take a little bit of our glazing fluid. So this is my satin glazing fluid, right? It's it's matte. All right, I'm going to put a bit off to the side here. This brush, I'm going to clean because we want a kind of a subtle treatment.
Let's go. Do a slightly smaller brush here. Okay. There's my glazing fluid. Let's take some of this gray. Mix it into our glazing fluid, which means it's going to go very transparent, depending on how much you put in there, right? bit of a stomping fit. Um, okay, I'll just show you what that compares. Again, it's not, it's, you can see there's a little bit difference between these two, right? They're supposed to be this kind of the same, but this is in shadow, so we'll darken that down as we go. Um, and similarly, we're going to lighten and darken some of those areas, all over the place, really, obviously. I think let's 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 do the face now. Let's uh, move on to that step. So we'll mix a flesh tone, and I'll use a little bit bigger brush. Okay, so to do our flesh, I guess we could just do this down here. Let's take our warm yellow. Take a little bit of warm red to give us an orange. So I'm gonna make a bigger batch here. So let's do that again. And just a little bit of blue to give us a brown. Okay. So that's our base color. Now let's make, uh, in fact, I'm gonna do this up here. And so if we look at this face, it's actually quite red, which is kind of odd, considering it's supposed to be so cold, but maybe, you know, when people get really cold, their cheeks get nice and red. So we want uh, a flesh tone that's gonna be a little bit warmer than that. Like this is actually pretty good for like your forehead, etc. You want a little bit more yellow in the forehead, but let's kind of get even a little bit more peachy. That's not bad. Okay, so let's put some, I'm gonna mix glazing fluid directly into that just to give it a little bit more thinness. And I'm just going to paint this all over the whole face here. So technically, uh, this would be almost kind of similar, maybe without the white, to the color that Loitza would have painted as his imprimatura, right? So if we had just painted kind of a warm brown underneath, then we could not skip this step, but we could just go right to some light glazing. I think on camera these look the same, but this is definitely a little bit more peachy, which is what we want. And I don't know if I'm going to take my face quite as rosy and red 
as we see in the image on the left, the original. That's that's pretty intense. And it's one of those things where, you know, when it's completed, if we do it exactly like the original, people will be like, well, why is his face so red? That looks weird. You'll be like, oh, no, 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 but that's what the original looks like. Be like, hmm. Okay, interesting. I don't know if I would make it so red. It looks kind of weird. But yeah, but no, but the original's really red because he's crossing the Delaware and it's cold and breezy. Yeah, it still looks kind of weird. So, again, if we're this is a very small section of a much larger painting. You know, if I recall, it's like almost four meters tall from top to bottom, and I think 13 meters wide? Is it that? No, I think it's 8 meters wide, right? So it's a huge painting, right? 8 meters is, that's like 8 arm lengths, right? So imagine 8 people hand in hand standing, like that's, that's a, these are big painting. And this, this is life size, so even right here, this is shrunken down. Right, so we would, uh, ideally this would be the same size as my own head, right? So it would be much bigger even here. Um, okay, let's blow dry this, and then let's. Um, I think we're we're ready to move on to the next step here. I do feel like having a gradient here might be really nice, but at this stage, it would be, I could do it, but it would be a little bit foolhardy because then I'd have to like deal with all these edges. That's why you want to do your background as, as much as possible, as early as possible, because then everything can go over top and just seamlessly cl like clean up those edges. But, uh, you know, again, that would take me another 20 minutes on top of everything. So um, we'll just keep progressing forward. Heidi says 149 inches by 255 inches. Um, which is big. <laughs> as, it, as we saw earlier when we were looking at um, some of those. In fact, actually... I just want to show on the Metropolitan Museum website we have a number of great um, images. As I, as I showed this one earlier, these close ups. Um, I just love that wacky frame. You know, each one of these figures has a lot of detail in them. Like, look at the this um, water here. I mean, those brush strokes, that's just gorgeousness. So you can see how it, loosely this painting was painted, right? You're, we're talking even... Like, let's say something like this here is probably about the size of my hand. So the painting, when you get up close to it, starts to fall apart, which is not unusual. That's what happens in a lot of paintings, right? Let's just zoom in. I'm looking at the black and white. Actually, let's... I was hoping this high-res version would have a little bit more clear. Oh, 
that's as far as it'll let us go. Huh. Anyway, let's get back to the matter of hand, Michael. Let's do our next steps. So generally, this would be where we would go back and work on the background. I was saying potentially we could do a gradient um, behind George Washington, but I think that that is kind of past because we've now done so much more detail here. So we're just going to now focus purely on the foreground. We're just going to now start glazing on the hat and the clothes and the face. So really, now we start to start making some decisions as to what is first and what is last so that we kind of layer properly so the thing that is kind of underneath everything is the face followed by let's say his turtleneck here and hair followed by the collar of the shirt um, and the hat followed by the cape right and so the cape should be technically one of the last things that we do so that ever we can then as we go clean up all these edges like so if we have let's say a brush stroke that's kind of wild like that we can go over the next layer and just really create a nice seamless uh, layer over top right so let's focus on the face right now and that probably would make people feel happy anyway because when we leave it to the end, people are like, oh, everything looks great. No, I have so much pressure to get this uh, finished. Oh, just for it to look good. Okay. So. Um, let's start. Uh, let's go to some darker values on this. In fact, actually, maybe even before I go that let's we want to make this eye a little bit we want to get the white of the eye back in place here and I think I'm going to add a little bit of this gray that we we'd used before so I'm just going to paint Kind of a little bit sloppily painted there, Michael, but it doesn't have to look pretty because all of this is going to get covered up by subsequent lines. And we're also probably going to glaze and darken that anyway. <laughs> Heidi says, I kind of like how it looks now. Well, I appreciate that, but I think we still got uh, a little bit of work to do here. So let's mix. This is our flesh tone that we, we applied here, right? That was kind of our just our base color, right? As I said, it was very similar to our Impre Matura. So what we want to do is now kind of add a little bit more red and give it a little bit more warmth in here. So we'll take our warm red. That's pretty intense. Let's put some white. And I'm also gonna take a little bit of my um, warm blue, right? That gives us kind of like a bit of a uh, What color would you call that? It looks sort of like strawberry smoothie. <laughs> and then what I'll do is I'm going to put a lot of glazing fluid in here. And I may even just mix to the side here. Just because I got so much paint in my brush. It's pretty opaque. So let's put even more glazing fluid in there. And you know what? I'm just going to actually wipe this brush off. I'm not going to clean it. I don't need to clean it, but there was just a lot of paint trapped in there, and I want more of that quality. It gives me more control because I'm putting less paint or less pigment 
onto the painting at a time. Now it's a slower method, but this is definitely how he would have worked. So let's look for where we want to use a color like this. Now, I think we want to put this in a lot of places. You can you can barely see it going onto the canvas, which is good because that means it's it's very subtle. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a blending brush. We have what we call mop brushes that are kind of made specifically for this. Because this is a brand new mop brush. This is what a mop brush looks like after you've used it for a while. And so those work perfectly fine, but I'm just going to use just a, another larger brush just to smooth out those edges. Right? Very subtle here almost imperceptible but that's how Loitza would have painted this painting this is exactly what he would have done maybe not exactly in this order or this color first etc but this is you know the the, the method the, the traditional way of portrait painting very slow methodical because it gives you a lot of control. And really, I'm kind of going over most of the details here that I've, most of the face, but because it's so thin, it gives me an opportunity to kind of look at the original and just kind of process what I'm seeing and just sort of like um, slowly kind of start seeing the different shapes in here. Now, I want to be careful about putting too much, or, or it's okay if I put a lot on there, but I want to let it dry before I start working back into it. Otherwise, I start wiping it off, and as if, if you've watched any of these episodes at any length, that's always, inevitably, when I get impatient, when I'm glazing, is when I'm swearing, in using my inside voice, right? Because I'm like, oh! you're just so impatient just blow dry it and then move on Michael so we'll blow dry it and then move on Okay. I mean, that is a red, red face. Well, let's just keep on going. Let's add a little bit more of this. And then we could start selectively doing less and less, right? Before we did most of the face, maybe it didn't do as much in the forehead because we're going to put a little bit of a lighter version of this color there. But as it goes, you'll start to see some areas are just going to get perceptibly, or perceptibly darker. You'll probably start seeing that a little bit more there. Smooth away every anytime I get like a hard dark line, smooth it away. Good. Okay, let's 
We'll try that. There we go, unmute. Okay, so I want to keep on going, but I think I want to do the eye next here. Um, so you tell me what color you think that is. I It looks to me kind of like a little bit of an aqua green. Slightly brown? I don't know. It's hard to tell. So... I think, um, where's my t little tiny brush? So I'm going to take this brown and just add a little bit more blue to it. We're gonna put a highlight in there later. We're also gonna glaze and do all a bunch of stuff. That, I want to get that started. Um. Okay. So let's move, let's, let's do a much darker color next. So we've got this dark, or this was my darker color, right? Let's take a lot more blue. And we got glazing fluid all over it. So maybe even while I'm right here, I'll just quickly, and again, I want to have my blending brush nearby. Be careful when you're using like your blending brush, you don't blend out into the background too, right?
So that little line there is a little bit dark. So I'll have to kind of fight that a little bit throughout the painting today. Kind of giving him a bit of a Hitler mustache there. We'll lighten that up as we go. But just kind of put that on my list of things to track as we go. Okay, let's blow dry this. Keep on going. Let's darken in this ear and hair. I should probably get a little bit of warmth onto those lips. So it doesn't look like he's got some kind of lip balm on. So I'm going to take a bit of my warm red and just some of the flesh color we had earlier. Try this because there's I want to use this red elsewhere. Okay, I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna add that little bit of red. Again, I'm going to take a bit more of this red. I'm going to put it on the ear. Kind of a saying goes, you, can, you can't get the ear red enough. So you can always add a little more redness onto an ear.
So, you know, <laughs> I look at it on camera and I'm like, wow, that does not look very appealing. In person, I'm really happy with the way it's turning out. So it's one of those weird things that sometimes the distortion of the camera is not flattering to this painting. Um, let's blow dry that again real quick. So I feel like now what I want to do is really start to add some um, lines onto the, where the eyes are, etc. So I'm taking my, my dark color and some blue, which has made it go a little bit more purpley. I don't mind that. Um, I'm not going to paint black anywhere in this painting, but I'm also not going to make my use my blackest possible color that I, I can mix by hand until the very, very, very end, until I, I, I see what needs a little bit of an extra oomph emphasis. So. Be careful because this is pretty sticky everywhere I'm trying to paint. All that glazing fluid has, a, you know, um, chemicals in there which slow the drying process down. So even if you blow dry, it's still going to be a little bit wet. Okay. 
So it's starting to come together. It still looks pretty rough. I'm gonna blow dry this and I, I wanna get one last little bit more darkness in this area. And then I'm gonna start lightening things because we've kept going darker and darker and darker. We wanna go the other way, brighter and brighter and brighter. So I'm just checking to see, you know, if it's still wet. It's still a little bit glossy, which tells me it's still a little bit wet, but I'm just gonna push my luck a little bit here and see how much I can get away with. I'm gonna add a little more glazing fluid to that darker color. Sometimes I also paint, depend, like I, I don't want too much a glazing fluid on my brush when I do this kind of stuff otherwise then you've got a it jams up your blending brush so let's get these cheekbones That's good, we're getting there. I, I actually think I'm gonna do just a few more and even up here. Okay, so let's go the opposite direction. Let's get some lighter values in here. So let's get, we'll take our, this color we had, uh, let's get our some white in there. Get a bit of glazing fluid. blending brush and
That's interesting. I like how he used a little bit of white right there. That's interesting. I haven't seen that really. Hmm. Interesting. That actually looks pretty pretty good for right now. So um, I might just leave the face for for a well. You know what? I might just do a little bit more. One more highlight. I gotta blow dry this. I gotta, computer, come on. Ah, you have to reboot that. One second here. Ah. The spam bots have arrived. There we go. Okay, now let's blow dry. Okay, I just want to do just a little bit, m just a tad bit more with a little highlight, because maybe I won't need to come back here if I, if I just finish this up now. We'll put a little bit of a white pop on the tip of that nose later on. So I think if we zoom back out, how that looks. Wow, that looks very different on camera than it does in person. This looks kind of pretty rough, but uh, in person, not nearly so. Um, okay. Let's try to get um, everything done here ASAP. So, uh, where should we? Let's do the hair next. So, let's take some of our black and white, make a darker gray here. Remember, it's a little purpley, so let's add a bit of yellow to make it a little more gray. It does even look like it's got a bit of green, but I, I wonder if that's to do with the varnish over top.
let's go to a darker brown. Let's take our uh, warm blue, warm red, and mix that together. Without anything else, we already got like a really dark color. So let's put a bit of yellow back into it. So feel, you know, feel free to use your imagination in this area, and this is all just going to get totally blackened here in a few minutes. So I just want there to be just the barest perception that there's the texture of hair and curls and Now I'm just mixing the last two colors together to get this kind of dark brown. Paint that in between some of these lines that I had up here. That's not really on camera much, is it? Okay, let's let that dry for a few minutes. Let's come, let's go do something else. What should we do? How about let's do the hat here next? So we got that dark color. This is maybe even a little bit more green than mine. I don't mind that though. Uh, so I'm just taking the color I still had on my brush, that dark brown. Let's just add a lot more blue to it. Maybe I will take a bit more yellow to make it a bit more greenish. Take even more, let's make it a bit more. And then add some glazing fluid next to it. So I still need more blue. There we go, finally getting the color up. Okay. 
So this first pass, I'm just going over everything. Maybe, let's just see, could I use this color anywhere else? It's really dark blue. Oh, right down here in the bottom. Again, there's some glazing fluid in here, which is going to keep that color looking you know, slightly transparent. And that way I get that brown that I like, that I painted there before. But now it's, looks, it's got a, a bluish brown quality. I can also take this color and start to kind of add a little bit of modeling in here. All right, so I can just soften the edge just by running my brush along that edge. I'll do a pass like that. Let's do Let's do one of these up here too. So you can see how that color reacts differently depending on what color it's being placed on top of, right? Now, generally, I would kind of take the time to add a little bit of the 
color like for instance a little bit of yellow into this but you know I'm kind of moving quickly and it's not that bad <laughs> so Let's blow dry this. Okay, so let's keep on going. Let's uh, um, what should we do next? Uh, I want to darken that significantly. So let's just take this dark color. I kind of like using this blue for this. I think it's working well. It's a little bit light. So let's just get a bit more paint on the brush.
bit of this. So I'm just painting with a little bit of my warm red and my black. Whew, okay. Um, let's keep on going here. Strange decision, put that much yellow in there, Michael, but... It's okay to have a few different kinds of, of shadow colors, right? Because there's all that reflected light, like, in here what's great is there's reflected light from the collar onto the shirt genius he's got a little bit of yellow in there like all those little things i don't know if we're gonna have a chance to do that at all but uh
Oops, I just painted that color straight as opposed to glazed. So let's just take a bit of that off. Just too, too dark, too intense. into this hat here. had a bit of white in there somewhere. Oh well, let's just keep on plowing ahead here.
do the the little narrow brooch, I guess, holding his cape together. I'm just kind of making this up here, just quickly putting something in place. Let's get a bit more darker colors on here. We'll just paint wet into wet. Just very, very quick, right? Let's do the opposite. Let's just take some white. I think we'll just have to wait for that to dry. It needs. Okay, I got a lot of wet paint on here, so I'm gonna blow dry this. Hey, oops, I just get paint all over my nose. <laughs> um, let's do the hat here. So I'm going to kind of fudge some stuff here. It looks like we got a cold blue. Um, where should, let's do this in the gray here. Take our cold blue, Get some white in there. And so this seems, you know, pretty dark, but when we put it here, it's going to explode. So let's. Kind of fudging some of these details. Got 
It's interesting how mine got very angular up top there, didn't it? Now I'm sure this crest has a great deal of significance and uh, I'm just probably butchering it right now. So my apologies to all the historians out there who are just cringing. Seeing all of this just, just softening up some of these edges. doing that now taking a bit of uh, glazing fluid mixing it into here maybe just a bit more white Try that. Okay, and I was just mixing up a little bit of glazing fluid to paint back over top of all of this. It's going to take a few minutes for once that dries for us to see what that actually looks like. But that might be good enough. Like, if let's just let's see. I didn't notice there was a little bit of...
on rolling ahead here. this color and
Okay. So, we're getting closer and closer to the end here. So let's do our finishing touches. I just want to do a few things like just selectively darken in a few places, do a little bit of almost like outlining and like my deepest, darkest shadows. Um, I could even use a little bit of black here if I wanted, but we're, we're almost done. So there's obviously there's going to be, there's lots more that I could do, but I want to wrap up ASAP. So let's look at what needs to be done here. So I want to, I mean, basically everything could get darker. And there's a few places that could get even a little bit lighter. So maybe let's do, let's do a couple quick highlights because I can, see a few places where I, I know I need to do that. So I'm going to kind of replicate a little bit of this pointillist kind of little dots that he's doing in the hat here. I think that's to simulate some, like a type of felt or kind of uh, like beaver fur on that hat. Let's just zoom in so you can see what I was just doing there. Sort of do this little dabbing there. Uh, I'm going to take this same color, just add more white to it. A little bit of glazing fluid because he uses this just for like some quick little highlights oh you know what this is probably snow I just occurred to me that this is snow that's uh, of course see what I'm doing here.
little bit of my fingertip on there, which got a little, a little white on there. So let's see if I can wipe that away. Let's get some darker color going here again. I still mix a bit of it into the my glazing fluid because it's nice to have um, that option of being able to blend or even wipe it away if I'm not happy with it. What's also really nice about glazing is that when we put like a dark color like this over top of things, it actually, it sort of like combines with the color that was there already. So I can use the same glaze painting over the gray and it makes the grays look darker. And then I can paint it over the reds and it makes the reds look darker, etc. Rather than having to mix up multiple different um, dark reds, dark blues, etc. I can just use the glaze once in different areas.
Okay, I want to tackle this weird thing over here. Not sure what it is, so I'm just going to kind of fudge it. Okay, I think I got all, everything getting very close. Get a bit of brown. Do I have any brown left on here? Ah, I hate having to mix color right at the end. A bit of yellow. A bit of warm red. Oops. A bit of blue. Just wanted to get a little bit of this on the back of his head here. This is the light from on the other coming from the other side, kind of illuminating his hair and just making it look a little bit brighter. best. I could wait for that to dry and do that a little bit again. Um, maybe though I'll just plow right ahead.
any glazing fluid in that. It just seemed a little bit too dark. Okay, so uh, last but not least is just this face. I'm going to blow dry. Okay, um, I want to do quick little glaze. I still got my my uh, warm yellow from before. I'm gonna take this. I want to just look at a, mimic a little bit of what he did here with the this um, warm yellow. I just that subtle little color that's great right just gives it this like little bit of a glow in there We could even do a bit underside in here, brighten that up. Now, I do want to darken that part of the cheek here and then we'll be all done.
time. Okay, we'll that, try that again.
<laughs> Paula says, good enough for government work. Almost done here. Just final little touches here. I am kind of compelled to make that a little bit more green, like the glaze that's, but I think that's, that's good. It's okay. So. Okay, so let's wrap up here. Ah, of course, right at the end. Everything sort of collapses right at the very, very end as you want to wind up. Um, there we go. Jeez. Okay. So I want to just do a quick little side-by-side -side comparison before we wrap up and say goodbye for the evening. So before we do so, just again, encourage you to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when the upcoming videos are happening. There's a bonus episode this Saturday, a feedback episode. Upload your artwork to the Facebook group so that we can share in the glory of your creation, as well as I can offer you a little bit of feedback on how to improve your artwork as you go forward. It's one of the most popular things we do around here, so I hope you join us on Saturday. Um, please consider leaving a donation as well if you found you learned something or this was hilarious and it's up to you. There's a PayPal link in the description below. You can use a super chat on YouTube as well as if you want to contact me via the uh, Facebook group or my website. All those links are down below. Okay, so with this incredible painting, we zoomed in on... Cap or Captain and General George Washington right there in the kind of the center standing at the prow of the boat and then here's the results of about three hours of painting um, not the best thing I've ever done but considering like our time limitations you know I was happy I spent a little bit more time than I usually do um, doing a lot of glazing and that's you know maybe not the most entertaining thing because the results are so subtle so time-consuming but we start to kind of really we're able to give a little bit more you know detail into like the jowls and this in his uh, his jawline all that kind of stuff in fact the more i look at it, ah, i want to do more but i'm just gonna walk away <laughs> it certainly could get darker in places for sure let's just zoom in i guess that was pretty close let's okay 
And again, it's it's interesting that generally when I zoom in on these paintings, it's not the most flattering thing for myself or the original artist. Um, we can see all the little blemishes, um, but uh, you know, it's not bad, not bad. But obviously, you know, this is the size of one of my fingers, so we're talking like minute details. And when we zoom back out, everything sort of kind of looks a little bit normal. Now, a few things. It looks like this chin kept expanding <laughs> further and further outward, becoming more kind of Jay Leno-y like um, versus in his, it's a little bit more rounded here. And he's almost, he's got a little bit of a double chin, which has sort of disappeared in, in my painting. Um, I also didn't have time to really craft his brow up there a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's, it's doing the job, I guess. Let's just look elsewhere here. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy. I mean, obviously, everything could go much, much darker. But uh, at some point, you got to call it a day, right? Let's look at the hat. Yeah, not bad. Not, not too un, I'm not unhappy with that. I added a little bit of snow on the back of his collar there, just to, uh, f just for fun, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, let's just come back here one last time. <clears throat> okay, well thank you everyone for joining me, for paying attention for so long. I hope you learned something. This was definitely a challenge. Can you imagine if we tried to do the whole picture? This is just one half, one half of, or even not even a quarter of George Washington and he's only one of like a dozen characters let alone the people that are in the background in the boats far away so thank you we'll see you guys on Saturday I can't wait to see all the work that you guys upload to the Facebook group we'll see you guys then until then enjoy the rest of your evening wherever you are on our beautiful planet and we shall see you all very soon goodbye everybody have a great night Thank you.